Canon Isaacs, you may proceed with. Today we remember throughout the world all persons who are living with diabetes. World Diabetes Day, November the 14th. We also remember doctors and all those involved in medical care who care for diabetics. We also remember those persons who are engaged in research at this time as they try to find remedies, cures for this problem. And we pray for families and loved ones who care for us. Almighty God, on this day, we thank you for your gifts and your blessings. We bring to you in a special way all those persons who live with diabetes throughout the world. We pray that you be with us as we manage this disease and that you will guide us and give us wisdom to discipline our lives so that we'll be able to enjoy good health in the best way possible. We pray for our doctors. We ask you to give them wisdom and understanding as they respond to the various challenges and issues that come with this disease. We pray for all those who care for us and our loved ones. Give them understanding and patience as they face many challenges. We pray for all those persons who because of their social standing in life are not able to access the best medical care at this time in the treatment of the problem. We pray for the World Diabetic Association Foundation as they, in their own way, promote education and care for persons. We ask you to be with us in this meeting, all those who will share, and we pray in a special way for our future speaker, give him a mouth of wisdom. We pray for the president and all the officers of the Diabetes and Hypertensive Association of Barbados, that you will guide us in the work that we do to help improve life for our people in our land. All this we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mrs. Wendy McCarthy, Miss Erica Anne Grace, Dr. Carlisle Goddard, panelists, Trustees, executive officers, members, staff, and volunteers of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados. Media practitioners, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados, I extend a warm blue circle welcome to all of you for joining us this evening for the 2021 John Grace Memorial Lecture and Panel Discussion. This month, Barbados joins member associations of the International Diabetes Federation in observing World Diabetes Day. That's the first observance of this annual day of recognition for the cause of diabetes. The world has been subject to natural disasters, financial and economic challenges, and numerous health crises such as the current COVID-19 pandemic. Against this background, the disease profile has changed, where we now have a significant proportion of the world's population grappling with diagnoses of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes. In fact, the 2019 projection of 530 million persons living with diabetes by the year 2030 has been accelerated 
with current statistics recording that we have already reached 537 million persons. The work of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados started 46 years ago. Our goals? Excellent quality of life for all persons living with diabetes and hypertension. Zero obesity. Zero new diagnoses of diabetes and hypertension. Zero complications and zero untimely deaths. This year, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin and embrace the theme access to diabetes care, we recognize that in ensuring the provision of medical services, treatment, education, and support services, that we will be well positioned to reverse this disturbing trend in our treasured homeland. This situation calls for urgent and critical action by everyone at the individual, family, community, corporate, government, and civil society levels. We cannot achieve these goals without resources and commitment. One of the founders of the association and president, Mr. John Grace, embodied the character and qualities that we should emulate in taking Barbados to the next level. This legacy event to honor him creates a platform to call us all to action. Let us reflect and be inspired by the life of Mr. John Grace, who embodied a call to duty, a call to service. John McDermott Grace, the first of his parents' children, was born in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada, and later moved to Barbados with his family. Other siblings followed, two sisters and one brother. He was educated in Barbados at the Ursuline Convent and Harrison's College. He started university in Newfoundland pursuing medicine, but when his father became ill, he returned to Barbados to run the family business. He met Kathleen when he was captain of the water polo team. They courted for two years, then married and had four children, Bill, Wendy, Zoila and Bernard. One day, Mr. Grace and Huma, another salesman, were in a doctor's office waiting to detail their products when they decided that they wanted to provide information directly to persons diagnosed with diabetes. In 1974, the then Ministry of Health held an exhibition involving all of its departments, with invitations extended to private companies. The firm W.S. Monroe & Company, which represented the Ames Company, the manufacturers of the test tapes, reported that the volume of sales of these tapes signified that there was a large number of diabetics in the country. The general manager, Mr. Grace, suggested to some doctors and nurses that an association should be formed for diabetics. After discussion with the Barbados Pharmaceutical Society, a decision was taken to form such an association. A small committee was elected to make the necessary arrangements for a public meeting, inviting all diabetics to attend and see if they were willing to form an association. They were. The Ministry of Health was approached and a date for the meeting at Queen's Park House was set. There was a full house at that meeting. It was a lively one and after much discussion, a steering committee was elected to draft the constitution. At the second meeting, the constitution was adopted and the first executive committee of the association was established with Mr. Grace elected as president and Mr. Mapp as vice president. The two main objects of the association at that time were to educate diabetics and to help any member who suffered disability. Mr. Grace, daddy to his family, was always working, thinking, looking out for how to help people. His contribution extended to the Boy Scouts Association, the Rotary Club, as well as the Barbados Association of Retired Persons, where he also served on the board. A man of great intelligence, yet did not have the opportunity to gain a university education. A kind man who looked out for his fellow human beings. And for his contribution to the Barbadian society, he was presented with one of our nation's highest awards for his work in the community, 
the Silver Crown of Merit. For us at the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados, we considered it a deserving and fitting tribute to create a legacy to honor Mr. John McDermott Grace, who was not only instrumental in the association's formation, but also served as the president for the periods 1975 to 1977 and 2001 to 2010. A truly amazing testimony of service and personal sacrifice for a man who did not have diabetes. For his sterling contribution and to create a legacy in his honor, we have chosen to name this lecture the John Grace Memorial Lecture. On behalf of the trustees, executive officers, staff, and partners of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados, welcome to the John Grace Memorial Lecture and Panel Discussion. The association was and is privileged to have been led by Mr. Grace, who was supported by his family. A special thank you to his daughter, Mrs. Wendy McCarthy, and granddaughter, Miss Erica Ann Grace, who join us this evening. As we now prepare for the memorial lecture, I hand over to a member of the association and chairperson of the Eastern Region, Mrs. Valerie Marshall. Our protocol having been established, may I wish everyone gathered here a very pleasant evening. I'm Valerie Marshall, and it gives me great pleasure to be your moderator for this evening's event. Firstly, a gentle reminder to keep your mics muted during the presentation, since we do not want to distract the presenters. Secondly, all questions will be entertained at the end of all the presentations. And at that time, we will ask those of you participating via Zoom to use the raise hand feature to ask questions. Those of you on Facebook and YouTube may post questions and comments online, and those will be relayed to the panelists. Every year, World Diabetes Day is observed on November 14th. This day was first marked by the International Diabetes Federation and the World Health Organization in the year 1991, in response to growing concerns about the Every year, World Diabetes Day is observed on November 14th. This day was first marked by the International Diabetes Federation and the World Health Organization in the year 1991, in response to growing concerns about the escalating health threat posed by diabetes. The day provides an opportunity to raise awareness about diabetes and the need to control it in its early stages. This year, 2021, the theme for World Diabetes Day is access to diabetes care. In acknowledgement of the fact that even in the 21st century, there are millions of people who have no easy access to treatment for diabetes. Persons living with diabetes need ongoing care and moral support to manage their condition and avoid any complications. Additionally, this year, we are also commemorating the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Insulin was discovered in 1921 by Dr. Frederick Banton, a Canadian doctor who was studying diabetes and the pancreas. It can be noted that the 14th of November is the birthday of Dr. Banton. So the discovery of insulin marked a major breakthrough in medicine and therapy in patients living with diabetes, especially those with type one. It is therefore ironic that while celebrating the centenary of the discovery of insulin, there are still millions of patients with limited or no access to diabetes care. This 
evening we have invited a feature presenter as well as three panelists who will share from their wealth of knowledge and varied experiences as they take us on an educational journey. I'm sure that at the end of this event, we'll all be much more informed on our theme, access to diabetes care. At this point, I will introduce our feature speaker. Our feature speaker this evening is a medical practitioner graduating from the University of the West Indies Mona campus in 1996 and subsequently compute, completing the Doctor of Medicine program from UWI and a fellowship in diabetes and endocrinology from King's College in London. In April 2006, he was made a fellow of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. He and his wife, Maxine, run two vibrant private practices in Barbados, the Endocrine Center, Inc. at Swindon House, Lodge Road, St. Michael, and Hopping Medical Center in Spikestown, St. Peter. Diabetes also features in other enterprises where he has served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Barbados Diabetes Foundation, consultant with the Pan-American Health Organization in the field of diabetes, and collaborated with other physicians and specialists to produce a primary care diabetes manual for the region, supported by training. He also is a committed lion. He is a member of the Lions Club of Bridgetown, achieving its highest award, the Melvin Jones Fellow. He is the second vice district governor for sub-district 60B and served as a past region chairman, zone 3A chairman, chairman for diabetes in the multiple district 60, and on the Lions International Board for Diabetes for three years from 2015 to 2018. Switching gears, he boasts of a household which includes eight big breed dogs and is also known to dabble in the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, to deliver the feature address, for the 2021 John Grace Memorial Lecture and Panel Discussion, let us welcome Dr. Carlisle Goddard. A blessed good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chairperson, for your wonderful introduction. Madam Trudy, I'm President of the Diabetes Association of Barbados, I know your, your new extended name, yes, hypertension and stroke as well, but I'm a John Grace fan of Diabetes Association of, of, of Barbados. And, and the board of executors, I thank you very much for affording me this special privilege to, prevent, to present this afternoon. Um, John Grace and I go way back, and I first met Mr. Grace back in 2003. I was a fresh graduate of King's College then in endocrinology and I'd gone to my first IDF presentation. And, and all of a sudden I heard this Barbadian accent loud and powerful. I said, who is that? All the way in France. And I looked around, I said, Carlisle, Carlisle Goddard? Yes, you're from Barbados? Yes, yes. I want you to know all of this is, it's nonsense. You gotta focus on diet and exercise, diet and exercise. That is what this is about. And I said, and you are? He said, I am John Grace. I am the president of the Diabetes Association of Barbados. I said, well, nice to meet you because I had never heard of the Diabetes Association yet. And as I said, I'm a fresh graduate from King's College now getting all excited about diabetes. I hear this formidable man come telling me that we got it wrong and we need to focus our efforts on the death and the exercise platform. And for all of us who know Mr. Grace, that remained his mantra throughout his life. You know, you had to get some education and diet into every presentation that you did. So I'm honored really to be given this address and I hope I do justice to the topic. 
The topic is described as excessive diabetes care. But given that we're celebrating 100 years of insulin, I took and um, presented this point of view and changed it a little bit. So I hope to marry the two as we go along. Feeling that, I was reassured by the president that the panel discussion will do the rest. So Trudy, I throw you under the, underneath the bus. So I need ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get the conversation going. So let's take a trip back down memory lane. I'm sure many of you will recognize some of yourselves in these pictures when we were much, I would say younger and I would just leave it there. But yes, we were a powerful association then and we should remain one going through the future. Diabetes is here for a while and it will be around. So we really need to chip in and make a difference. I want to pause briefly to acknowledge Professor Michael Boyne and John Walt, whom I had the privilege of using some of the slides to make today's presentation. So as we're celebrating diabetes, Let's take a walk down time. In 1500 BC, diabetes was first described in writing and it was done by the Hindu writers who wrote that flies and ants were attracted to the urine of persons with a mysterious disease. And that disease caused them, that caused them to have intense thirst and had an enormous urine output and it was followed by wasting away of the body. In 2050 BC, the word diabetes is first used and it was coined after the, uh, or the term diabetes is coined after the, the phrase that mean to go through or to siphon. And the author that I saw that the person who had diabetes or just had this mysterious illness was passing so much urine, it's like the water was running in the system and running straight out. And gradually the Latin word for honey became added to diabetes. And here it was added on the basis because the diabetes caused the person to produce urine sweet. Uh, sweet urine. So it was the sweetness of the urine, which I liken it onto honey. So then the two words became married over time, diabetes mellitus, and as we have it. Further on in 50, 150 BC, um, the Cappadocian claimed that diabetes is a wonderful affliction, not very frequent amongst men, um, being a melting down of the flesh and the limbs all into urine. The flow is incessant, and as if the opening of aqueducts, it took a long time to form, but once it got attached to the person or the patient, they were, their lives became very short lived. And it was as though they were melting rapidly and death was the ultimate outcome. More so, it made life disgusting and painful. Thirst was unquenchable, excessive drinking by the person and one cannot stop them from drinking water or making them stop passing urine. And then they also became affected by nausea, restlessness, and a burning thirst and a desire at no distance term that would expire. And as eloquacious as that may be, we can now relate some of that to the symptoms and signs of diabetes, be it a high poor or hypoglycemic event, because you will find a little bit of both in the discussion as we go along. But even before our time, people began recognizing the features of diabetes. The Greeks in, in 1000 thought that our physicians recommended to patients that they do excessive horseback riding to reduce urination. So by sitting on the saddle and making pressure against the prostate for the men, it would stop the men from passing so much urine, or so it was believed. And then people introduced bleeding and blistering and doping, all different things, just to cure diabetes because it was eating away at life. And as far as 1915, Sir William Oxley even recommended the use of opium as a way to stay off diabetes. So if you think marijuana is now new to treating diabetes, we got a long way to go, huh? Overfeeding was also a common form of use to compensate for diabetes because they thought because a person was wasting away by overfeeding them, you could then make back up for the caloric deficit. But because they weren't treating the underlying problem, that was not an, an answer to, to the issue. And if you talk about keto diets to treat diabetes, as way back as the 1990s, Dr. Frederick Allen recommended a starvation diet for the management of diabetes. So as this historic journey continues, there's always been a quell to and a quest to find what diabetes is all about and to make it better, to educate people and so on. In, the, in 1798, it was documented as excess sugar in the urine and the blood. And then later in the 1813, um, someone linked it to glycogen disorder. 
and then a German medical student discovered the isolates cells in the pancreas. And for the first time now, we have a link to an actual organ where the defect was occurring. And so the story came about that the pancreas was fundamental in this whole disorder of diabetes and what was happening. We then had someone making an extract from pancreas and lowering the blood sugar of dogs. And, and if that's the case, then he can probably be claimed as the first person who discovered insulin some 10 years before the noble Banton and Best Pair. Before insulin came about, diabetes truly was a debilitating disease and death was guaranteed. And these, these diagrams show you here quite clearly the first person who ever took insulin. And this was him um, on um, September 15, 1922. All sticks and bones cross a quarter in some cases with a distended abdomen and wasting away. And two months later, I've been given a shot of insulin. This figure transformed itself to this. Miraculous, wasn't it? And this was the time when we didn't think our sense was even anywhere near where we would expect it to be today. At that time, diabetes was a death sentence. As I said, you were expected to die between weeks and years of onset of the diabetes once the process started. In 1922, Leonard Thompson was the first person to be injected with, by Banton and Bess with insulin. He was 14 years at the time and he weighed 64 pounds. Yeah? Imagine that, 14 years old and weighed 64 pounds. Not unheard of in Barbados. But there it was, back in 1922, this young man got insulin and from there onward, he became into the individual that you can see in this photo. So if you were to take a, a time back, this is a, what a 14 year old fellow looked like compared to now, when he started to then open up and take on his weight to later become this figure. Leonard lived to a relatively healthy life for 13 years to the age of 27 before dying of pneumonia. At that time, no penicillin was available. So we cured diabetes at that point for him, but he later succumbed to a secondary infection which is very common in diabetes um, and pneumonia. So coming out of the 1920s, you had a massive gold rush for insulin and its production. And in May 30th, 1922, Eli Lilly signed an agreement to pay royalties to the university to increase insulin production, then become the first drug company to sponsor the production of insulin. Insulin then was known as U10 and later U40. Um, the main problem between the two was that it was given as an intramuscular injection in the butt and it led to various abscesses because we know diabetic patients had, or sorry, persons living with diabetes have so much staph infection of the skin that abscesses and so on infections are very easy to have. So you're having an unsterilized process like we would have it today, injecting a needle into a big muscle you're taking stuff from the outside into the inside of the muscle, no doubt leading to infection. As I mentioned earlier, the life expectancy of, of uh, was very reduced prior to 1922 and, and the availability of insulin. But by 1940, look at the startling difference. If you started your life with diabetes at age 50, with the onset of insulin, you move it to 65.9 and average, uh, average life. If you started your diabetes at age 30, you would wait to age of 60.5. If you start your diabetes at age 10, you know, you go up to 45 years. So even though 10 and 45 might be a small gain, that's a whole addition of 34 more years of life, which is a lifetime in today's world. But was this a cure for all? Unfortunately not, because despite treating diabetes, patients were still dying. Some early users died of low blood sugars, some made recoveries. But by 1940 now, we begin to see other complications of diabetes. We saw more infections coming about with the abscesses. We had then eye disease coming about clearly, uh, more clearly. We had um, cardiovascular disease starting to show its head. So we now realize that insulin was not the only model for the cure or for the management of diabetes. So while it was a big chunk in the management of diabetes, it was not the all for the management or the cure of diabetes. 
So what causes complications in diabetes? Is it the high glucose? Is it the genes? Is it the environment? And so during the middle of the 20th century, this was the biggest debate that continued into our time because it's always a concept of the environment versus the genes and who interplayed what that made the difference. So from way back when we knew the genes played a part, but we also know the environment of the host also played a part. So you need to manage both sides of these curves when you're treating a person living with diabetes. Big studies then started to begin to roll out in the 1970s. So we had research like the big DCCT and other studies coming out showing that as you improve glycemic control, persons got better, they lived longer, they had fewer complications, and it improved their sense of well-being and afforded a better lifestyle for persons. Unfortunately, managing and following the studies during the, the, the decades that passed and the, and the improvement of insulin, we did not gain much more control of diabetes. Certainly when I graduated from medical school, um, diabetes control was having the equivalent, having the equivalent, having the equivalent A1C of, of 9.7 here back in 1996. And then it went from 9.7 to 8.6, and then down to eight, and now finally down to seven. And now in 2020, 6.5, or even trying to be less. So from way back then, we've always seen that is a need to get this control of diabetes tighter and tighter and tighter. So in today's current world, the current A1C goal is 6.5% or less. But even achieving the A1C of 6.5 or less, we still have not mastered diabetes because people are still dying from diabetes. They're still getting heart attacks and strokes and amputations. So we still are missing a key factor in all of this besides the advances of having insulin. So how do we know what control is about. We know that the A1C gets better with increased testing. And there's always a big fight because people say, what evidence show that multiple testing of your blood sugars gives better control? There are a lot of real world, real world studies that show that with people testing more frequently, they can get the pattern where the sugar spikes and when what not to eat and what to eat and when to eat, with how to exercise and how to adjust their medication. So that's real. And that helps the individual to control their diabetes better. The economist would say at the end of the day, it is not reducing deaths or strokes or heart attacks. So because of that, they're not invested heavily enough into the um, promoting of self-testing. But we as an individual know the more our patients test, the more value we get. And in this cartoon here, it shows quite clearly by Paul Davidson and others that by increasing testing per day, you can reduce your A1C because patients can now see the, the influx that's having on, on their blood sugars. And that certainly will make a difference. What else controls the A1C? Frequent insulin doses, because by giving insulin on demand, we have shown definitively that we can treat the, 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 the rise of the blood sugars postprandially, which means that once a person eats a meal, because of the diabetes imp impediment, they cannot produce insulin on demand. So by giving small aliquots or bolus of insulin at a time, you can then treat the, the rise of that sugar at that time of a meal and bring it back down to baseline. By so doing, you've reduced the amount of time that the sugar will be elevated. And it's not how high the sugar goes, but how long the sugar stays up. And so by reducing the elevation of the sugar, you can now reduce um, the, the onset of complications. Personally recording the blood sugars. The more people can systematically do profiling, they're now paying one-to-one -one attention to what they're doing, what they're eating, what is um, one little things that affect the blood sugar. So by frequent recording or frequent testing of your blood sugars, there's an associated 0.5% reduction <coughs> sorry, an A1C overall in that patient. So for those who argue there's no big change in multiple testing, here's the evidence. Both the Italian Diabetes 1999 showed definitively you can reduce the A1C with multiple testing. But the other techniques such as carbohydrate counting, regulating what people are eating and when they're eating and regular small meals access also helps in the reduction of the A1C. What causes high A1C? 
And I'm thinking about A1C in this audience because I presume you know that A1C is that marker of blood glycemic control every three months. You know, every red blood cell in your body has a sugar molecule stuck onto it. And as the red blood cell ages, it sheds its blood sugar. So in a sample of blood, you can recover the last three months how accurate a person blood sugar control has been. And the A1C is a diagnostic tool for diabetes as well as a monitoring tool to see how good your sugar has been controlled. So an accurate carb counting, an adequate eating or excess eating or overeating, not exercising, not not monitoring how your sugar fluxes based on your exercise versus on your mood swing versus on your onset of your menses. All these psychological things can impact on a blood sugar as well. So if left to human devices, we sometimes overlook a lot of these little factors that impact on our blood sugars. So we've turned it over to other forms of devices such as the, the Freestyle Libre and other devices that can now in real time monitor your blood sugars to give you more real-time evidence of what your sugars are doing with respect to a meal, with respect to a stress or and so on. So technology has evolved to the point where we can now use technology to trap our blood sugars and, and indicators of what can elevate the blood sugars. But as people, we remain hindered to our own selves. Compliance is the biggest issue that persons living with chronic diseases have. Why? Even I cannot explain that. Non-compliance, however, is claimed by some to be not a patient's problem, but a system failure. I agree with that to some extent, but you know, guess what? My diabetes is my issue. Your diabetes is your issue. So some of the blame still has to lie with you if you want adequate control. But yes, we do know that our current global approach to diabetes doesn't work if we just individualize it to a particular aspect of the care. It's a multidisciplinary approach that's required. So if we want to be very aggressively controlling our patients, we need to look at all the outliers as well and pull everything in so that we can get a better control of our patients. So yes, patients um, inertia, physicians inertia, persons not willing to take medications anymore, person excuses when it's mango season and so on, these are all contributors of the problem as to why we cannot get adequate control. Current treatment interval. Unlike many other chronic diseases where current treatment interval is not critical, the current treatment interval in diabetes is very, 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 very critical. I cannot overemphasize that because standardly, we see a doctor probably every three, four, six months, depending on how the pocket goes with the money, depending on how the next appointment schedule, can fit an appointment and so on. But guess what? Diabetes requires day-to-day, minute-by-minute management. If you're having your period, for instance, that's a stress in itself, and it will raise your blood sugar. If it's mango season and I decide, oh, you're having 10 mangoes, because that's a beige gen, then clearly your blood sugar have to go up. So can you be eating mango for all of mango season and your doctor three months later? The A1C has to be out of control. So that can happen. So we require a system where patients can be monitoring themselves more in real time. So perhaps every two to five hours and then adjust the sugars accordingly. And this is what is called the critical treatment interval because we now have to empower our clients and our patients that the control of their diabetes rests in their hands. And as such, they're the ones who have to do the testing. They're the ones who have to do the logging. They're the ones who have to look after their diabetes care. So I'm trying to create or express to you a big shift in the paradigm where we push back to the patient and say, you are your own destiny controller. You will determine if your blood sugars will come down or not. We will give you the tools and you will learn to use these tools to get more effective control of your sugar. If you're unable to take up these tools at this time, tell us how else we can help you so we can at least try to reduce some of the complications for our patients. When a system is not working for patients, trying harder will not work. Only changing the care system or our approach to work. So what does that really mean? Sometimes we tend to blame our patients for not doing all the things that we say to them to do. Because sometimes we, we don't lead from the front by telling our patients how best to control the sugars, how when to exercise and so on. Sometimes we play the blaming game. You, you, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. You're too fat, you're not moving, you're not exercising. And that creates a lot of negativity within the patient. And so persons living with chronic diseases, if you're bombarding them with all this negativity, 
the take home message is a negative stance. You can never get a positive outcome from diabetes. So my approach in life is to have a bartering system on patients. You give to get, you do for do, in patient power lines, huh? So we tell the patient, what are you willing to do now to trade to get some else? So like me, I always fight, you know, Christmas is coming up, great kid, got to run through. So if that's the case, what we can give up? Because, well, for me, Carl, I got to, it got to be pork and ham. Not great kid, you can't get through. So if you want cake, you got to trade something, you know? So should I get diabetes later in life? Then thank God diabetes and pork don't go together, so I might get away, you know? But still. You, we have to bark and we have to find something with our patients that you can exchange. So when it comes to exchanging calories, for instance, you're going dinner tonight, you know you want the crumble We got to have that tonight. And that's so then no rice and peas, no macaroni pie, no mashed potatoes can go down tonight. You have to give up something. So you find a way to get in to your patient a bartering process so that at the end of the day, there's an exchange process. Now, I've been doing a lot of back and forth where I'm trying to convince you that we have technology and we have our patients and how best we can get that. And ultimately, what I'm trying to get to is a symbiotic relationship between technology and our patients. So I'm trying to bring you from the decade of insulin syringes and vials to a, a new model where we're using far more pens than syringes and needles to a point where we're moving from testing our urine to now using glucometers to test our sugars, now to the point where we now have freestyle Libre and all the other fancy monitors that we can do or monitoring rather than sticking to evolve to the point now we can use insulin pumps to deliver insulin as opposed to having to stick ourselves on a daily basis to then ultimately to pancreatic replacement and closed loops and all those fanciness to come in the future. Of course, it can be quite a hefty sum, but we can work because we've been working with insulin syringes for ages. And now in Barbies, we have pens. So we're getting there, people. We're moving. So don't think of a Star Trek, you know, we're getting there because we don't have Libre and all that other things that we can test our chickens and go pricking our fingers. So we are growing. We are, we are diversifying. We are expanding. So the move for diabetes has not remained static since 1922. You know, we've come a long way forward. So we need to converge more with our patients now, open up their minds to say they're no way of doing things. So soon we'll be gone the days that you have to stick your finger every time to have another device which you can now get an easier blood sugar um, reading without sticking and go on. I was introduced yesterday to um, a new glucometer which comes almost like a watch. You rest it on your hand and leave it there and it now reads your, your skin and gives a blood sugar reading. It's having some little trouble with the black skin, the heavy pigmented skin, but it's getting better and better so soon even the Libre may have competition because now you can put your, your wristband on, boom, boom, your blood sugars are live and die right before you even sticking yourself. So the evolution is, is here and it is on. I subtly put some pumps in there because ultimately pumps are where we need to go because patients now have complex schedules. We know we are busy with children. We're busy doing school, running around. We're busy doing office meetings. We're busy doing Zoom meetings. We're doing conferences all over the place. Who have time to be sticking themselves regularly and giving instinct? You know, we get, we've we gone into technology. So now has come the, the day of smart pumps, where pumps can now, we can tell them how much carbohydrates we're going to ease. It does all the calculations. Tell us, give you for yourself 14 units of insulin or whatever the case might be. And once we can go from telling the pump what we need, the pump should also soon be able to sense what we've eaten and so on, and then calculate for us what we need. But ultimately, I'm trying to get you to the point or the discussion to a point where technology has now afforded us devices that can now assist us in giving ourselves insulin to the point of the correct dose and so on based on the input of information. The smart pumps today allow you to tell it what you're going to eat. You can even find... Um, macaroni pie and, and salt fish, bojo and so on now in some of these machines because they don't have West Indian menus in some of them. So when you say, oh, I definitely don't have that in there and I don't need to, I don't need to count it. No, the pumps have become smarter and smarter and more and more menus are being incorporated into the building of these devices. And when we have more access to these devices, we're going to get better with our pumps because the pumps can track what you're eating they can track when you're about to eat. And some of the pumps now are going to the point where they can predict your blood sugar is going to be low at a certain time and alert you ahead of time. Some of the new devices are so good 
that you can enter to and three close relatives, um, details and phone numbers or email addresses into the pump. And as your blood sugar started to trend down, it will send a, a Bluetooth message or a message by email to your close contact saying, Carla's sugar is trending down within the next hour, he may have a blood a low blood sugar. So right away is midnight in Barbados and my friend is in, in London, they call me saying, what young man we doing? Your blood sugar is going down, you notice? And even so that now shows expansion of the care group. So when your children go off to university and have such a device, you can still stay in tune with them and help them to manage their low blood sugars. So all of these things are coming with the smart pumps that are available today. All right, the pumps can remind you when to test, they have various alarms and so on. And it's just all the technologies that are our fingerprints. So once upon a time, we died from diabetes, we died from high blood sugar complications. Then came Bantam and Bass who delivered us with insulin. We then had to get the insulin in our bodies, we got the sugars down. Then we had a problem with testing ourselves because we didn't like testing our urine. Then we didn't like sticking our fingers. So now we have modes of not having to test your fingers, but then we say, how do we get the insulin in? Do I have to joke myself or stick myself every time? So now we have pumps that can be inserted and carried on your body that can deliver. So technology is out there answering all of the problems that we create or come about as, as, as a blockades to not controlling our blood sugar. So soon, I hope you would notice that the excuse module is getting smaller and smaller when it comes to not testing or not taking your insulin. So when you meet up people like me and you didn't take your insulin, you know, holy hell again rain because what is your excuse now? So hopefully you're with me as I show you how we're small in that gap of excuses. Of course, pumps are mechanical and they're not God-given. So in terms of God, um, that they're perfect. So they can't tell you all the things. They can't tell you not to eat or they can't tell you did not eat today so your sugar will drop and stuff like that. They cannot capture all the adjustments without you inputting the data into the machines. So the only thing because you have a pump that the pump automatically make your sugars perfect. You still have to do due diligence. You still have to do some testing. You still have to input some data into the machine to make it right. So I spun you all the way out to sea and I brought you back to the devices and the technologies that insulin is related to and how to test. But the fundamental problem with diabetes, however, lies not only with sugar control, there are other parameters. And part of that paradigm involves fat, sorry, atherosclerosis, abdominal fat, insulin resistance, hypertension, inflammatory states or post-thrombotic states. These are all part of the milieu, the mix, the pepper pot kind of thing that goes on that predisposes persons living with diabetes to greater complications from diabetes. And it is the understanding of these factors here that help us treat diabetes a bit better, understand it a bit better, how to attack it so that we can get better outcomes. The endothelial reactions. This then leaves the body, the blood vessel constrict, reducing the blood flow forward into stroke, gangrene, and a and, and, and lot of damage that tissue. When that comes, when the body is injured, it then reacts by releasing a million and one little chemical enzymes that want to get perpetuate inflammation and clot formation. And in this whole unstable arrangement, while these little pieces going in and out and so on, some become loose. And when that happens, pop goes the weasel. A little piece gets it, goes down the blood flow and blocks off a blood vessel. Instantly, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, you have kidney failure, you have a gangrene limb. All of these things are happening simply because the endothelium has been affected by all the inflammation occurring because of the high blood sugar, the hypertension, the pressure going through, the, all the excessive fat. And once that happens, Ultimately, you get a cardiovascular event, and that cardiovascular event can come in the form of a heart attack or a stroke, as I said. So from a physiological point of view, this is what happens in a heart attack. This is your blood vessel on the outer side here. This is the inside lumen. This is the, the, the blood vessel that is all clutched together. And this is the inside lining of the blood vessel, which technically should have been here on the inside. It now got peeled off and lift off that it broke to pieces here. And then all this excessive blood clot came and flew down the system, blocking up the arteries 
a little later down in, in the circulation. And this is a consequence of high cholesterol, high, high sugars, poor control, diabetic control, and, and such like. This is what we're trying to prevent our patients from getting. Someone also said that if we live long enough, all of us will get diabetes. And this has always troubled me for a while because why should I get diabetes? I don't have a genetic history of diabetes if I'm not overweight. Why is it such an important thing? Look at our Barbados society. As we have more and more centenarians, as we're living longer, diabetes is now going up and up and up the curve. It's now almost outdoing hypertension and hypertensive heart diseases. And the question is why? So to answer this thing properly, imagine that you were born in true Bayesian form with a bucket full of insulin. As you go through life, you're scooping up from that bucket. You're scooping up from that bucket. So if you get overweight, you have to scoop up more because there's more tissue to supply um, that will need sugar to go around and, and easy to get the sugars through. If you work your body to a point, stress it out with drinking, alcohol, using drugs, or not exercising, not, not looking after your body in general. You do all of that, then your body has to supply more insulin to move stuff around because the more stressed you become, the more insulin is required to now liberate sugars or to move sugars around to give you energy and keep your brain awake. So if at age 40, you have suddenly increased your, your insulin demand, you are clearly now dipping out of that bucket more and more. So when you reach age 50, buddy, you've already used up that insulin already because you used at age 40. So lo and behold now, it's not surprised that age 50 you now have diabetes because the finite bucket of insulin you had, the well has run dry. You've used up too much insulin out of that bucket because of how you carried your life and so on. So I said all to say that the beta cell mass, the cells in the pancreas which supplies the insulin eventually run out or start working properly, depending on the stress that you present the body. And the commonest presentation is obesity. The more overweight we become, the more obese we are, then we demands are higher and greater, so you have to take more and more out of that bucket. So ultimately you reach a point where you've used like, your future insulin. And as a result, you will now have diabetes in a type two fashion. Type one, the beta cells got damaged for whatever reason, and just were simply not able to produce any insulin at all. And as a result, the same sequelae occurs and the end result is the same. The bit type one or type two, the pancreas is unable to produce enough insulin. And now you're in a state where you have no insulin left to carry out your, your duties of your body. So age, genetic, insulin resistance, which Mr. Grace loves, are all big players in the pathogenesis of diabetes. Diabetes causes many, many, many um, illnesses. And the relationship between fasting blood sugar and macrovascular disease is very, very obvious from the cartoon. The higher blood sugar, the more vascular deaths you are. The lower your blood sugar suddenly drop, the higher the risk of a heart attack because of the greater stress on your body. So it's long-term given that there's a close link between your blood sugar levels and the risk of heart disease. So these are some that we have to take in mind. Consensus over the years have looked at um, how to control diabetes and when to introduce medication. I'm going to gloss over this pretty quickly because we know most of this and this is not the, the, the stress of the, of the presentation this evening. So at the point of diagnosis with diabetes, we must implement lifestyle diet, dietary changes. The guidelines have changed now to say, the moment you look at someone, see that they're overweight and they have acantosis can't and all the risk factors for diabetes, you're going to implement lifestyle changes, diet changes, but also say to them, here, take my girlfriend metformin. She will help you to lose some weight. She will help you manage your blood sugar. She'll help you clean out your liver of some of the excessive fat to get this to get the, their body now reverting back to normal. Depending on what the blood sugar levels are, will determine if you need to give them more medication, such as a sulfur urea, a DPP4, SGLT2, or if you need to have cardiovascular disease, SGLT2 earlier than the metformin and such like. Or if your sugars are so high along with the insulin and lifestyle, sorry, along with the lifestyle and dietary changes, you get them insulin therapy right away. So it all depends on what potpourri they present with that you determine what is your next mode of operandi to help them to change their blood sugars. But remember above all, 
everything begins with the management of diet and exercise. You cannot have a discourse on diabetes unless you speak to diet and exercise. Diet and exercise is the beginning. It is the end. It is the all, everything that ties it together. So back from 2003, when I first met Mr. Grace, he may not have had the science in his head, but he had the concept right. Diet and exercise ties all of the science together. The, 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 the diabetes prevention studies show that really clearly, if you really, really, really push diet and exercise, diet and exercise will do far better than any medication you can put out there. Because if people eat the time, eat small meals, eat frequently and eat the right things, they don't have those high glycemic surges. But they don't have those high glycemic surges, they don't need excessive insulin. If they don't need excessive insulin, then we got this thing covered. So I cannot overemphasize diet and exercise in all of this. It may not bring the person to start having complications, but without it, they cannot finish the race. <clears throat> So these are different cartoons here, which shows you the benefits of having an A1C less than 7%. The lower the, and all the Smarties, the, gl the Glargine, the, the Glitin, and all the other Smarties that we may use to treat diabetes, the ultimate aim is to bring that A1C down. And the closer that A1C approaches seven, then the less and less complications that we have. This study looks at a long acting insulin and some of the newer modalities like Genovia and so on, which shows you with the early onset of some of these newer medications, we can get a much better um, inroads into the control of diabetes and the glycemic complications. One of the major complications of treating diabetes is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is the low blood sugar. Now, most of us say, when I'm hungry, I feel a little anxious and I get a little ratty and I feel, you know, a bit revved up. That is in no way comparison to having a blood sugar drop below four. And I tell you this, huh? when I was in, in uh, doing my, my master's and so on, we had a lab where we had to give ourselves insulin. Now, I am obsessive compulsive. Everyone knows that. Trust me, when my blood sugar started to hit 4.3, I was sweating and my mind was leaving me. And I, I know me, I'm in total control of myself. And at that blood sugar started to drop close to four and started to hit 3.9. And I realized I was losing control. I freaked out because I need to be in control. And when I can't control my thoughts and my body and so on, and this is for me with the experiment. Imagine if I was a person living with diabetes and taking insulin and this happened to me in the blue. So whereas when we get hungry and we get very agitated, that is nowhere near in compassion to your sugar really dropping low for real. Huh? So a hypoglycemic is an event that a person living with diabetes will not want to repeat on a regular basis. And because of that, that also creates the biggest barrier to control of diabetes. And if we lower the sugar to the point where persons are having severe hypoglycemic events or low blood sugars, they will not take their medication because they do not want to feel like that. And so we need to tailor our medications to such that we get proper control, but we still reduce the number of low blood sugars that the persons are having. So moving away from medication a little, let's slip back into the corner here a bit. Body weight. Body weight may increase with some of our medications, such as the use of insulin, but is that a real thing? People believe that by taking insulin, you can get fat. By taking insulin, your body can get fat. These are all wrong messages and they're not true, they're myths. When you take insulin, and your body can access the insulin and move the sugars now around your body, the first thing that you will do is gain weight. Yes, the Bible said it, after every famine will be a great feast. When your body is starving from diabetes, the moment you get a taste of insulin, all that backup sugar that really did sit it down, get rush inside you. Your body can use it what it needs, but then remember, hey buddy, I remember starvation, I'm not doing that again. So let me put some next door for, for safety day. So when the, sugar, when the insulin goes awry again, you have some store of fat and stuff there. And that's what happens. The body remembers a negative experience of starvation. So it puts aside some of the food that is now, it can now access as storage. And that's where you're gaining the weight, not because of the insulin, but because of the evolutionary pattern to protect the body, to protect the host, the body holds on to the weight. So as you use insulin, Yes, 
there will be some weight gain, but it's not from the instinct. Is your body trying to protect itself going forward? Belly getting fat from instinct. There's no scientific evidence there. It's just that you're not eating badly and the fat sticking on the belly. So no, no, no. Instinct does not cause weight gain and does not cause your tummy to get bigger because you're taking it. We've all seen this cartoon and this cartoon is real. 50 years ago, we never looked like this, but this is the reality. Even I do have a little tummy. This is the reality of today because despite all the gains in science and so on, we sit too much now behind our desks. We work too late now. In the old days, you had a family structure where grandma or somebody live at home. So even though you're out there working, by the time you get home, there's a meal well prepared for you. Now with more women out there working than men, the men on the block so they're not doing nothing. The women working hard and have to go home. Which woman in her right mind can go home at seven o'clock and prepare a meal for her family? That's not gonna happen. So we can stop by ring ding fella down the road. We can stop by the road and collect some food and we can take that food home. It may not be healthy as a food, but at seven o'clock the night, who going home to cook? Let us be real. And not gonna happen. So as a result of evolution of, of how things have happened in our lives and who is now the money maker, the breadwinner, the family, who's the provider, and so on, the matriarchal role of a woman preparing the meals in the house can no longer be the right model because the women haven't worked a whole day at work, now come home to make a man happy and create food and provide for children and do more work and so on, that's not going to happen. So if that's going to happen, then more fast food will work. So no wonder when I try to go home on evenings, I can't get back to the roundabout because the Shafat line on the other side wrapped around two lanes and the, and the Kentucky got a lane and a half blocking on both sides of the road. So I can't get out. I just got to sit down there. And everybody see Dr. Garden and the Shafat line. We ain't really true. I just mean to get through the line to go home. Yeah? But that's the reality of where we are at. We need to change our approach. Life has changed so much that our energy and take has gone from previously eating to live, no, no, we now live to eat. And that's a sad state of where we have come. But unfortunately, it's the reality of how life has evolved for us. So we long for this day, but this is the real day because it tastes real good and look good too, huh? But that's the reality of where we are. So I cannot conclude this presentation without touching on Mr. Grace's um, famous piece, Obesity and Children. He was very children were right dear to him. And this is what an obese child in one of our clinics looked like. This is the reality of, of Barbados in today's world. You know, the prevalence of childhood obesity has increased dramatically across the world. Uh, over 42 million of our children, zero to five are overweight or obese. And the International Obesity Task Force in 2011 pointed out that 50 million children were already overweight. That does not speak good at all at all for our health. It now has become a public health um, area of importance. And it's even more so than the pandemic that we go through. And as I said in an earlier lecture, because of where we are at now, but before children may overweight, now with the pandemic, children not going to school, children not active. And before in this generation, the only fingertips were active, a heart and mouth and their brains. Now we're gonna have a greater distress where coming out of the pandemic, more and more of our children will be obese because they can't get to school, they can't get low PE and so on. So because of this, there'll be a greater pandemic coming out of this pandemic, and that is a higher rise in childhood obesity. Childhood obesity is now associated with increased lipids, increased heart attacks, increased blood pressures. So obese children are at a high risk of becoming obese adults, and that's a reality. So coming out of this pandemic, we will see far more obese, obese, obese adults and simply the generation are that we're more obese children having children because they are at home and not burning. Barbados is now ranked as a high income country. And as a result, we have less access to funds and for, for um, research and so on. But as a result of all this hype in our economic status, our debt has changed. Our low social economic status has changed. And so people think that they now need to be with, with the Joneses having all the other things that the Joneses have. So the need for ground provisions don't have changed. And now we need wing dings and we need high flavor pizzas and all that thing as a daily staple. No longer is it, it is it is um independent season or republic season, I guess. Where are the conkeys? Hardly seeing one. 
But we seen plenty of macaroni pie. Yeah? Where are the fish cakes? Even though they're high calories, but yes, I still bitch and I want fish cake. Can't see them either. All of our cultural things have changed. So whereas we did have some stuff that made us prone to obesity as children, we also had more access to green space for running around and, and, and exercising, and we had to exercise. Now in this current age, we're not exercising, but children by extension will become more obese because the food preferences and the exercise availability are far less and there's less exposure of our children to good nutrition and healthy lifestyle practices. So as a result, there are less fruits and vegetables available. There's less fish. Half are going to Trinidad and God knows where else because we can't get flying fish. And sugarcane is gone. More houses are on the agricultural land. So there's less people, houses that have food and so on in their backyard growing up. Children don't even know what it is to look after sheep and goats in the evening now because there's no space to raise animals and so on. You know, how many children have pet pets at home that eventually will become food for Christmas or food for Independence Day and so on. No, we have we have guinea pigs and we have birds and so on now, but we don't have sheep and goat and cow to look after. So long has changed those days. So the responsibility, the food choices, the food abilities are all less and different to our children. School meals now is now rated via unhealthy exercise. Children now have so much access to money that now they they um, can get macaroni pie and so on in the schoolyard from vendors and so on. They no longer get how many people get macaroni pie with veg? That don't happen. So the nutritional benefits to our children are less and very restricted. Our debt has truly changed from a leguminous type of food uh, to hand picked foods and so on to the fast food era. And that fast food era will be a downfall. So we need to pay more attention to what our children are eating. Grandparents are to be blamed here. Huh? Studies have shown that grandparents spoil the children, they give them whatever they want and so on, increase pocket money, fast food, very on the weekend because they want to be the loved ones and so on. What my mother would not give to me, she not gives to her grandchildren. And I go, mother, you the same mother who raised me? Can't believe it. But then again, they're not my children, my grandchildren. I don't get to spoil them. I had to look after them. It's not the story. How much of us echoes those sentiments, huh? Sports. Sports have significantly reduced in our schools. I know there's a lack of school because of COVID. We don't have active children. And because there's less sporting events, a lot more more unhealthy foods and food beverage being promoted. A lot of the games are now sponsored by high calorie companies. And so the children seeing this now don't have the impetus for exercise. Long gone are days of getting water from the standpipe and running about playing football and so on in the district. We now have cars, we have cell phones, we have iPads and all type of things. So we now are sitting up in our bedrooms and in touch with the whole world and no physical exercise except for our eyes and our fingertips. So physical activity is long needed back in our, our cohorts with our children. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed my discourse. I hope you shared my excitement as I try to walk you through moving from the onset of where there was no incident, the point where incident was a sal salvation, to the point where it, the, sal the, sal the savior then did not pan out as we thought it would. Then we moved to different modalities for the person living with diabetes so to make their experience different than to back up with different problems than to realize we ourselves are part of that problem. How can we make it different? We now have all the tools available to us, but yet we have all the excuses and even more excuses to go. We now talk about diet and lifestyle as a tentacle that joins everything together. But unless we are willing to join it together, we cannot go forward. So I hope you have enjoyed with me and I enjoy sharing with you. And I wish you and the Diabetes Association the best of God's blessing in your anniversary. And I hope that we can have time to share in the discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Goddard, for your detailed and informative presentation. I'm sure that at the end, we will have several questions for you. So now I'm going to invite the panelists or three panelists
to make their contributions. I will just introduce them one by one and they will make their individual uh, presentations. We cannot proceed without hearing from someone whose life has been impacted significantly from a diagnosis of diabetes. This young lady diagnosed 13 years ago with type one diabetes, currently holds the post of quality assurance analyst for an American company, Virtual Business Valley. She is a proud alumnus of Queens College and gained a Bachelor of Science degree in actuarial science from the University of the West Indies, Mona campus. She loves mathematics, yoga, reading, and coffee. Here to share from the patient's perspective on access to diabetes care, we welcome Miss Monisha Sydney. Monisha, over to you. Good night, everybody. Um, so a little bit of background. Yes, I've had diabetes for 13 years. I was first diagnosed um, at 10. So I was diagnosed a couple of months before I had to do the 11 plus exam. Um, about six. Let me ask you a couple about six. So that was pretty stressful, obviously, having to navigate um you know, you have the pressure of wanting to go to a good school. And then here comes diabetes, you know, trolling on in, saying, hi, here I am. So um, all in all, going through that phase where I had to um, test myself for the first time ever, I had to give myself insulin. I had to do all of these different changes and make all these different lifestyle changes. It was challenging because obviously it was like I had diabetes my friends didn't um I knew nobody that had diabetes I have type 1 diabetes not type 2 I have no family history of diabetes so having to face this was so it was overwhelming it was frustrating at times it was challenging but funny enough um I did pretty well because I completed the 11 plus exam and I passed to Queens College. So that was great. And I was also the top girl at my primary school. So I, um, I guess that shows that, you know, living with diabetes is, it's challenging, but it's not like you can't overcome it. It's, you can live, you can live with diabetes and be normal. So I went to Queens College, um, love that school. And then I have like, you know, I graduated with six, six, um, six or eight, not eight CAPE subjects. And then I have nine CFCs. So here we are again, you know, and we have to study and we have to do all these different things and we still have to exercise, we still have to do diet, but still I'm a regular person doing regular things, achieving anything that anybody can do. So then I left Queen College and I went to university um, in Mona. So then um, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Actuarial Science. So here we are again, you know, having to go through the same study processes as any, any other person would and still graduating as any other person would. Diabetes is not something that is insurmountable. Um, through the years, I attended um, the diabetes camp that they have, the Diabetes and Hypertensive, Hypertensive Association of Barbados. They have this annual camp. And I attended that. And that was really helpful having to um, interact with children that have diabetes. Because at 10, I felt like I was the only person in the world that had it, which is not true. But, you know, that's how you feel. You this thing is just now coming down on you and it's like oh my gosh how could this happen you have no idea how this happened and you have to now navigate through life at 10 to figure out okay i have to give my insulin to myself i have to do this and my parents have never ever given me insulin and they've never ever stuck me let me just say that i test my blood sugar myself 
I give my insulin to myself. And that was from the jump. My parents have never, ever given me anything like that. Because I don't know. For me, it's like you either do it or you don't do it. You either want to live or you don't want to live. Right? It, it, it's a very simple thought process for me. To live, you take the insulin. You do the steps. You eat properly. You exercise. You don't want to live. Well, then you just don't do those things. You know, you don't have a very nice life. But as you can see, I look pretty normal. I talk normal. I behave normal. I'm a regular person. We are all regular people. And, um, you know, in terms of access to diabetes care, I have been a part of both sides of the spectrum. So I have, um, I'm 23. So I have been um, with the public side of healthcare for about six years. And then I switched to private care about seven, eight years. Dr. Goddard is actually my doctor. So um, I'm with him. I'm with him right now. So, you know, um, that's, that's fine. You know what I mean? In terms of the public side and the private side, I feel like you have equal access. So public health care, there's nothing wrong with that. I was there for six years and it was a wonderful journey. Um, for me personally, my parents just preferred me to have access to private health care. So, and I've just stuck with that now, right? But the Diabetes and Hypertensive Association, they give me access to things like the test strips. They give you needles. They give you um, insulin. But I think it's their sponsored child program. And I think that runs up to like age 25 or somewhere around there. And, you know, it's pretty accessible for public for public um, access, because if you can't afford it, they give you everything you need right from the from the um, from the get go. From you have the testing, the testing kind of what you call it, the little device that you use to test. You have the test strips, you have the medication, you have everything. And then the private system, though, I mean, it's it's really the same thing. There is no, I mean, you can't in Barbados at least. We have great access via either system, public or private, to healthcare for diabetes. And let me just also say, if you are in, um, if you visit a private doctor, you still can go to the Diabetes and Hypertensive Association and get support. I think um, as children, as adults, whoever it is that has diabetes, the one place that they should know about is this association because it helps. It helps in terms of the financial because diabetes healthcare can become really expensive sometimes, and they do help to cut the cost for you. So um, all around, public or private, we have great access to healthcare, and um, I think that I am a living testimony that you can live with diabetes and you can be quite normal. Thank you very much, Monisha. Um, I think we can all agree with you that you do look very normal and you are behaving very normal. We agree with that. All right, we are on to our next uh, speaker. Diabetes and medications are frequently intertwined. His 30 year career has been served in the retail pharmacy sector as well as it, the academic arena, lecturing in pharmacology and related areas in the nursing and pharmacy training programs offered by the Barbados Community College. To further his career, he is pursuing a master's in public health at the University of the West Indies, in addition to certification in teaching he is passionate about living an illness-free lifestyle and through public speaking, promotes healthy, natural lifestyle choices as a major preventative measure against disease, morbidity, and mortality. Presenting the pharmacist's perspective, please welcome Mr. Robert Carter. Mr. Carter? Good evening. Thank you very much. 
And so this evening, there are three takeaways, uh, three or four takeaways uh, from Dr. Goddard's lecture. So I want to talk about those before I go into to drugs. Um, as much as I am a pharmacist, I like to talk around the, the drugs before we get to drugs. And so Dr. Goddard said tonight, you can have a discussion about diabetes without you cannot have a discussion about diabetes without talking about diet and exercise. Diet and exercise can do far more than any medications. You also heard tonight that step one in the management of diabetes involves lifestyle changes and the use of metformin. And we're going to talk a little bit about metformin in a minute. And we must find ways around medication non-compliance. And I think Dr. Gardy did an excellent job of looking at the options that are out there to reduce non-compliance among patients in general, in particular diabetes patients. Caricom leaders signed a declaration in, on NCDs, and they did that in 2007 in Port of Spain. And uh, since then, Barbados has been able to achieve one of their major goals, and that was taxes on sugar sweetened beverages. There were, there were multiple goals of, the, of this declaration. Um, and while we are happy that we have a tax on sugar sweetened beverages, the tax is only for local manufacturers. So those, that tax does not apply to imported beverages. And we got a lot of imported soft drinks. And so when we talk, we talk seriously about taxing sugar sweetened beverages, we must seriously do it. And if we're talking about reducing NCDs, we must really make the legislation global. And then we are moving now towards front of package labeling. And I'm happy to see it advertising in the media. That is another um, goal of the, um, the CARICOM Port of Spain Declaration of 2007. And we can do it if we work towards it and help reduce the prevalence of NCDs. But what can you do? This is what the governments are doing. But what can you do? And I'd like to talk to the average public. Aerobic exercise, swimming, jogging, walking, riding, not weightlifting, that doesn't do anything. Increasing the, the intake of low glycemic index foods, that those are foods that do not raise the blood sugar very, very quickly. All right, and you can Google those, low glycemic index foods. Taking your medication as prescribed by your primary physician and taking your medication on time as prescribed and, and, and being consistent. And also one of the things that, one of the bigger problems along with non-compliance is polypharmacy. And if many, I, although I'm in academia, I've had calls, many calls to go to several houses where a doctor will, will visit one patient, a patient will go and visit one doctor rather, and then they will go to another doctor without telling the doctor the history. And so when this patient, gets this new medication from the doctor, they start taking the old, the, the new medication and continues the old medications. And many times the medication is the same. There may be a different drug name, maybe a brand and a generic is the exact same thing. This lady collapsed at my church. When I got to her house and I looked at her medications, she had two or three sets of medications from three different doctors. And so you need, it is important that you tell the physician when you go to a physician it is it is not the physician's fault when you get into trouble when you collapse it is your responsibility to tell your your physician that you have been to another doctor previously this is what was prescribed this is the medication i'm currently on make sense because it, otherwise you're overdosing and you're putting yourself in a high pole when you next day i want to talk a little bit and explain something because for the average public we hear about insulin resistance but do we understand what insulin resistance is? And if I can share and give you an idea, give you an analogy of what insulin resistance is and what you can do about it, in part on your end and, and, and on the other end from the doctor's point of view, taking your medication, but from your end, what you can do about it. Um, I think we would have done a, a good job here this evening. So the analogy uses um, a doorknob. And this doorknob represents an insulin receptor that's on the cell. And this key represents insulin coming from the pancreas. And what else I have in my hand is a fatty deposit, fatty molecule. 
And what happens with insulin resistance is not so much, and, and you, need to, you need to, I want you to get this and take away this this evening. It's not so much type one diabetes that you don't have any insulin. And it's not so much type two diabetes that you have a shortage of insulin. But the biggest problem with, with diabetes, with insulin resistance, is that when your fatty deposits, as the doctor spoke about, become deposited, they become deposited on your insulin receptor. So when your insulin comes along to bind to that receptor, to open the door and let the glucose out of the bloodstream into the cell, it, it can't do it. It has one job, and that's just to put insulin on its receptor, open the door. What can you do? You can exercise and you can reduce fatty foods and you can lower, increase your low glycemic index foods, low in sugar foods, low carbohydrates. And the more you exercise and the more you do that, the more this will disappear. And if you're being managed with your doctor, step one, as Dr. Gardner said, was metformin. And metformin does this too. Metformin removes the fatty deposits from the insulin receptor so that insulin can do its job. All insulin is to do is to open a door, turn the, open the door and let the glucose out of the bloodstream where it was high into your cells where it can be metabolized and used. If it can't even just get to the door, we have a problem. You can take all the insulin you want. You can take all the sulfonylureas you want. You can got to be taking more and more and more until you recognize that you've got to include diet and exercise and get these fatty deposits off. Obesity is the problem. And so I leave that with you and I hope that that is clear for you to understand. This is your job. You need to get rid of these fatty deposits that are blocking the body from doing its natural God-designed job. I leave that with you and I hope that it resonates with you. Um, diet and exercise as we go forward in managing the non-communicable diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you, and I'm hearing you loud and clear. Um, I appreciate that presentation. All right, we are moving to our final panelists um, for the evening. It may seem an anomaly to include insurance as we address access to diabetes care. However, this topic requires a holistic dissection. We have therefore invited a professional in this field with 15 plus years under his belt in the insurance sector. He is a qualified financial services specialist who works in the capacity of insurance sales advisor, serves as chairman of the Barbados Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, and holds the designation of fellow in the Life Underwriting Training Council. He volunteers in other capacities, through the establishment of various programs, such as care of the elderly and caregiver community program, managing money for secondary school teens and the primary school stationary aid program, which were executed under the Barbadian Families and Friends Relocation Association. Additionally, he serves as the director of Paradox, or Parent Education for Development in Barbados, and facilitator of the financial planning module of their parenting class. Join me in welcoming Mr. Roderick Nurse. Mr. Nurse. Hi, good evening. Um, Ms. Marshall. Um, let me thank you for your welcome and 
the president and the board, it is indeed a pleasure to be here with you as we look at you know, this very important uh, topic. My focus will be on the medical insurance. Um, and let me say that I will agree with, I think Maurice, Maurice, Maurice is her name, uh, that we are blessed as a country with a very good healthcare system, a public healthcare system. But I think one will admit that over the years, we've seen a decline in the service. And sometimes that fear has driven people to look for the alternative in private care and private care is costly. To underwrite the cost or to try to address um, private healthcare out of pocket is, is a joke that's not tenable. So people then use the alternative where we look then to, for private insurance to cover, to cover that cost. Um, but there's another reason, apart from the concerns we may have about the public healthcare system and indeed, we do have a lot of services of which we can be justly proud. Um, the, there is an, another element of access to care that might not be available on island. And you have that choice that is available to you with the private insurance. But our, our people travel. And as we travel, especially if our children go overseas to study, there is a need then to have a kind of service that is portable that you can leave and go to another country and then be able to access um, the healthcare. So despite what we have, and I do look forward to seeing an improvement in our healthcare system, that portability um, and that need for us to, 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 to travel will result in the need for private insurance. So it is, it, is a, it is a service that is here to stay. But I will be the first to tell you that of all the mystery that surrounds um, insurance, then private insurance, it take, private medical insurance, take, it takes the cake because there are a number of moving parts. And very often uh, we've come to expect a certain level of service and a, le a certain level of give from, from healthcare and um, in terms of paying for it. And that some of the assumptions may not be true. So. This evening, I am hoping that I can address the questions that will seem important to you. And I then look forward then to your questions. So at this time, I will pause and turn you back over to the moderator, Ms. Marshall. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nurse. So ladies and gentlemen, those are our presentations for the evening. We have heard from Dr. Carlyle Goddard, and we have heard from our three panelists, Ms. Monisha Sidney, Mr. Roderick, sorry, Mr. Robert Carter, and Mr. Roderick Nurse, who have all presented some very interesting and informative information for us. So now we are going to go to the question time where hopefully you have been taking note of all of those queries that have come up in your mind as we have had the presentations and you are now ready, willing and able to ask the questions. The feature speaker and panelists are all ready to give answers. So it's question and answer time. I have a first question coming up here. How does one know they have diabetes and what are the symptoms? Again, would, would you like to handle that Dr. Goddard? Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Yes, the, the, the correct answer is that the only way to tell you you have diabetes is by doing a blood test. Now, a lot of people will argue this point because people say, what about weight loss and passing loss of urine and so on? These are symptoms that are very common with a lot of other metabolic conditions. They do not speak directly to having diabetes. So yes, because the sugars are high, you will pass a high volume of urine and there will be urine and there will be sugar in your urine. But the diagnosis of diabetes is a fasting blood sugar on two or more occasions above, above seven, or a random blood sugar with symptoms above 11. 
They now even take the A1C to conserve for a diagnostic point of view, which is against a blood test. An A1C of 6.5 or greater is diagnostic of diabetes. <coughs> so, excuse me. So, you really need a, diag a blood test on two or more occasions to make that definitive diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question coming from a registration that says John Grace Memorial Lecture. Person has raised their hand. Would you care to voice your question? My question is about uh, sugar substitutes and whether they are advisable to take, and if so, which one is the best one to take? Okay, the, the question is on the floor. Um, Dr. Goddard, I believe. Yeah, you thank you very much. one as well. Yeah, so, so again, a good question. There's always been a, a question in diabetes as to if, uh, what are the sugar substitutes and so on. For many, years people have toasted on, on the internet that they're carcinogenic and they cause cancer and they're so bad for you but really the sugar substitutes are just amino acids um that we're using so they can't be bad for you because they're amino acids and what they do is that they stimulate simulate the taste the taste buds in our in our in our tongue for the taste sensation so you get that pleasurable taste of something tastes sweet or something tastes sour or something tastes um salty so all that they're doing, they're doing is that. Now, from a diabetes point of view, they do not worsen diabetes because they're not sugar. It's just stimulating the, the tongue to tell you something tastes sweet when they find it really doesn't, doesn't have a taste. But what we have found from all the tests and evidence and research is that the long-term use of sugar substitutes do not help in terms of worsening diabetes, but it doesn't stop the craving. So persons who crave sweet stuff will continue to crave sweet stuff and crave sweet stuff. And so ultimately, they're going to start consuming sweet stuff in the end. And that's where it gets great because if you're substituting for sugars long term, why do you want people to go on to, to sugars in the long run? So where you so they use a short term use. So when you're converting to say a no sugar diet in your tea or something like that, you can use substitutes at the beginning. And granted, you get used and used to that watered down taste, then ultimately try cold turkey without any sugar. For those who bake and can't use the excessive sugars, there are substitutes such as equal and spend and so on. Now, we shouldn't be selling one brand over the next. So for me, when I advise my patients, I don't sample all because the taste is different. It's an individual taste experience when it comes to sugar substitutes. And so you should try them and see which one you prefer because some leave a very bitter taste, some make you feel nauseous, the different senses that people get from the use of these products. So they don't worsen your diabetes, they don't cause cancer, they're not cancerogenic, but in the end, they don't change your risk for long-term diabetes uh, progression because the sugar craves remain there. Thank you very much, Dr. Goddard. Um, the next question coming up is for Mr. Nurse. Mr. Nurse, why is insurance so expensive <coughs> for people with diabetes? I saw that one. I saw that question come up in the chat and um, it, it really wasn't what I was expecting <laughs> in <laughs> terms of the cost. Um, but Dr. Goddard said earlier that um, the, the nature of diabetes affects so many organs of the body. And if it is expensive for, um, let's say, a person applying for life insurance and not to go too deep in there, um, the, if, you, if you are charging an average person a dollar to undertake risk, because now you have this, this, this disease that can affect so many areas in the body, then there's a higher possibility of death. And because of that higher possibility, then you will be required to pay a higher premium for it. It is not, it is not um, that you want to, be, to punish a person, but it's just the reality that, you know, if you are dealing with a person that has a substandard health, um, health rating, then the cost will be more. It's, it's a similar thing to a smoker. 
a person that smokes will, that smoke will pay a higher premium than say a person that don't smoke. That is just, just the reality because of the risk that's being carried. Um, if it is health insurance that you were talking about, and there are points in time where the diabetic can access health care, um, just to walk in and say, you know, I'm a diabetic and I want health insurance, you will be declined. Um, that is a fact. But it is then knowing the opportunities for entry um, to health care. For example, if you are working at a company and the company is now launching a health care, a health care um, health insurance um, plan, then everybody will be able to come on the plan. Diabetic, cancer, it doesn't matter. Everybody will come on because we have what is called open enrollment. But let's say that the plan is started and you have gone to join the company and this is pertaining to, you know, I'm talking about a company's group plan. You have 30 days after probation in order to come on again, that is open enrollment. The birth of a child, that is where the child can come on, no medical evidence. And, and that is the, the, the ideal time, um, you know, that you really want the child to have, have access to medical, medical insurance. If the child has a severe um, disability, that child will remain on the plan past 25. And in the case where you have a spouse, the person working at the company decides to take a spouse, then that spouse, you've got 30 days again in which the person can join without any medical evidence. Now, any claim that the person has, um, there is no difference in costs. Uh, for, the, for the diabetic or the non-diabetic, um, let's say after the first year or so um, on the plan, then the, the claims are, are quite normal. So there's not really a distinction in, 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 in the costs um, for a diabetic on a medical plan. But yes, there's a distinction when it comes to life insurance. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Next question on the chat. What priority is being given to the mental health of diabetics pre-COVID and post-COVID to assist in the holistic management? Uh, Dr. Goddard, can you take that one for us? For me, I was... Sorry, I'm hearing you now. Can you just repeat the question for me? Yes. What priority is being given to the mental health of diabetics pre-COVID and post-COVID to assist in the holistic management? That's a very large question. Um, so, so persons living with diabetes and any person living with chronic um, non-communicable diseases or disorders rather have significantly mental exhaustion and, and stressors in trying to come to grips with the diagnosis, dealing with the regimens of taking the medication and so on. So in a multidisciplinary um, team approach, we always recommend the use of counselors and psychologists within the team. And these are significantly um, good team, team players. Um, when I was at King's College London, we ha always had a diabetes psychologist on, on our panel. So when we did our group sessions, she would be able to interact with some of the, the clients and help us um, help them overcome some of the barriers. In Barbados, that's generally not um, done as an open thing because of the whole taboo of mental illness and so on. So what I do in my practice is that I get them to do a one-on-one -on -one with my diabetes specialist nurse who can then make them more aware of the facilities available to them and counseling as a whole. And when they start to embrace that concept, then we have um, a panel of counselors who we use, who we then assist them to make contact with and have them express how to do with chronic disorders and so on. The hospital and so on don't provide generally for this unless the person has an illness. And so it's probably best to be left in a private forum that you then seek assistance for your mental health issues. Coming out of COVID, all of us will have mental health issues. COVID has impacted us on our time, our space, confined us, compressed us, suppressed us. COVID has done a lot of things, just including some good things. But in terms of our mental health, COVID will have a significant 
uh, which is what we call adjustment disorders, where we now have to, because of this situation, readjust ourselves. The person living with diabetes is already feeling pressured. So now in these new environments, all these new restrictions, that pressure is increased. So there needs to be some outlet to assist with the mental health and mental health issues. So who do we turn to? We have, we have to utilize our mental health colleagues, the psychologists of Plankton Barbados, if it's more pressing than that. And, and I met a person the other day who said they're having thoughts, the negative thoughts now of how to inject themselves or how to just stick themselves in the wrong place because of all the repetition when it comes to COVID now and the susceptibility of, of getting COVID just by people now coming in contact and because they feel immunocompromised because of diabetes and so on. So I realized that that took the whole discussion to a new, new dimension that I really need to just decompress that person and just get them to let it all out and then give them assistance. So it comes on to the healthcare facility, the healthcare partners to work close with that person and every healthcare professional can be a counselor. You have to lend that ear at that moment and enjoy to diffuse the situation, but then focus that person to the correct resource person to help them out. So I'll give you a very long-winded answer to your question, which should be aimed. We don't have that much mental health support in public service. It is available privately. Uh, how to access it becomes costly, but at least if it is really needed in the health care to share in a person's burden that we need to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, there is a comment here uh, directed mm -hmm. to Mr. Carter and um, not exactly a question, but you may want to offer a response. Uh, Mr. Carter said yes, something sir. about no weight lifting but strength reasoning exercises are good for diabetics because it helps. What yes, do you sir. say to that, Mr. Carter? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, the strength reasoning, as he put it, exercises, the resistance training exercises are relatively good for type 2 diabetics. The exercise, the aerobic exercise um, to which I was speaking is beneficial for type 1 and type 2. Um, but there has been... It, it, the American Diabetes Association has listed as unsure the benefits of um, the resistance training in type one. So um, there may be ev evidence for it in improving insulin resistance and, and body mass and so on in type two diabetes. Um, but overall, type one and type two diabetes benefit more from aerobic exercise as opposed to the anaerobic resistance type training. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, to the panel, particularly the young lady, Monisha, um, you're in the hot seat. How realistic is it to stick to a healthy diet in Barbados? Fruits and vegetables cost more than hot dogs and pigtails. Monisha, would you like to offer a comment on that? Um, so for me, uh, I think it's fairly realistic. Let me give that a bit of background. Um, my parents are surrounded by a lot of trees. So I have mangoes, I have sugar apples, I have golden apples, I have a lot of different fruits available without me having to pay for them. The things like blueberries and such, like obviously you may have to get those from the supermarket. Um, in terms of vegetables too, my mother tries to grow a lot of her vegetables. Obviously, this is not something that everybody is able to do. So um, in terms of it costing, you know, not the same as hot dogs or pigtails, um, you can start small. So if you can, you know, you could try growing something of your own. Like you could try growing um i don't know hey sorry you could try growing something like that just you know to have a banana or something every morning um you could try going to the vegetable market too instead of going to get vegetables from a supermarket that's what my mother does because you get it cheaper so although you know you have to kind of get up at five o'clock in the morning to really go down the vegetable market and get what you need to at a decent price um it is still 
possible for you to afford certain things. And in terms of getting things from supermarkets, if you can, always try to get it from, I would say, a plantation rather than a supermarket. So my mother would go and get a pumpkin from um, there's a plantation not too far from us. I honestly can't remember why it is. But she makes note of these things inside of her head so that, you know, when certain seasons come around and certain vegetables or certain fruits and stuff are in season, for example, cucumbers, um, pumpkins, like I mentioned, um, carrots. My mother does not buy those from a supermarket. She gets those from a plantation and there are plantations out there that do sell these things and they cost way cheaper than a supermarket would. You really just have to kind of ask around and ask people, call around to figure out who's selling when it's in season and such. But it is possible to afford, um, you know, fruits and vegetables at a decent price. Thank you very much for that, Manisha. Um, Hopefully our inquirer has um, some important information there. Um, I'm going to come back to Mr. Nurse. Mr. Nurse, there are a number of questions and concerns coming through here on the chat about the cost of premiums for diabetics. And there is also here a suggestion that even though there is no family history of diabetes, the premium is also quite high um, for the person um, who's making the comment. Um, would you care to say anything further on that? Is it that um, persons living with diabetes um, are being charged higher premiums and what, what um how is, how is it going? Okay. Um, I'm going to answer that. Before that, though, I want to compliment um, Ayesha on her, on her answer. I thought that that was very good. Um, I, she mentioned the sugar apples, and afterwards, I need to contact Trudy, and, and I know where my sugar apples will come from very soon. So I thought her answer was very good in terms of the diet um, that, that, that is available. Um, to address the question when it comes to costs, um, and... I came into insurance in 2008, and I'll tell you this. One of the things that I was very surprised about, because as you go through the questionnaires, you're asking in terms of family history. And it became evident to me that we have a number of people, definitely over 50, with diabetes, and we've got a, a, a cohort of youngsters also coming up with diabetes. That when I asked the question, do you have any um, illnesses within the family? And the client says, no, I tend to ask the question again. Because I get so in tune to hear diabetes and high blood pressure that it becomes almost a norm to do that. But it is coming in then to the area of insurance that I realize the nature of and the kind of problem that we have. Um, yes, it is. You do have the complications, and yes, you are dealing with risk. The and 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 you do have to pay a higher cost for it. Weight is an issue where a person is overweight. There's no diabetes in the family. There's no high blood pressure in the family as well. But Dr. Goddard and, and, and Mr. Carter pointed out that these, the, the fat, you know, and they're, they're the medical experts, predispose people to, to those illnesses. So it is a reality that as much as you may be able to control um, what is happening to you, and, and reality is not every person can. If you are suffering with a thyroid disease, if it's hypothyroid, then yes, you will, that weight gain is something that will be very difficult um, to deal with. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, it is really just about lifestyle. So I'm saying, yes, your, your lifestyle will predispose you to certain risks and certain problems. And to my mind, yes, there is a higher cost that you will pay for, for the premium. But reality is there's a higher cost you will pay in life on a whole. So um, I can't change the rates because we've got, you know, and, and I mean, I, I speak as one selling the product, interfacing with it and understanding from the insurers, insurance company's perspective, as well as understanding from my client's perspective. But I, I, I must say this, that you might have a, a case where a person is rated, either that they're overweight or let's say, for example, in the case of the smoker, if the smoker can stop smoking, you can get the standard, the preferred rates. If the person that is overweight can look to lose weight, you can come back to the insurance company and the, the insurance company will reduce those rates downward. 
Um, so there are ways that you can look to reduce the premiums, but, but by and large, it, it, it really comes back down to, to a risk that is that, or, or a lifestyle that predisposes you to early death or predisposes you to a lot more illnesses. And therefore you get a premium that kind of reflect the risk. And I think that's the best way you can answer that. All right, thank you very much. I think that was um, quite clear for those persons um, on the chat who have been querying the, um, the level of the, the premium. Thank you. Uh, there is a uh, Sylvia Yearwood who has raised her hand um, on the chat. Sylvia, can you pose your question, please? A very good night to all. Um, before I, I pose my question, um, I just want to make a few comments. Um, I thought that Mr. Gollard was excellent and there is so much um, in there that we can take away. And Mr. Carter um, example with the clock, with the lock, I thought that that really brought home the message finally. Um, I want to really identify with Mr. Goddard um, tonight from a personal point of view. For the last two years, I have been going to my doctor. I was being um, diagnosed as a pre-diabetic, but I have been exercising four days a week. And I thought, well, don't really pay that much attention. It's just pre-diabetic. My mom is 80. My dad is 85. There's no there isn't anyone in my family who has diabetes, so don't really bother about that. Just continue doing what you're accustomed to it. But on the 2nd of September this year, I went to the eye specialist and he said to me, um, just keep still. I want to scan your eye. There's something going on in the back of your eye that I need to make sure that I have it right. Are you a diabetic? I said, no. When I left that office and I drove home, I said, child, you have high cholesterol, you're taking a tablet, you're hypertensive, you're taking a tablet. Lord, I can't add diabetes to this. No, this, this really is not fair. It's not fair to Sylvia. I came home from the 3rd of September and I got up every morning for seven days, especially churches on Zoom. And I walk for one hour. And I changed the complete diet, as Mr. Goddard said, exercise and diet. I cut out everything in a tin. No hot dogs, no luncheon meat, no bacon, no pork. I cut out everything. And just include a fish diet, vegetables and fruits. And I'm saying to you, my bill is no higher than when it was buying all the other rice and potatoes and pasta. I just cut them out. And I find enough to eat and I'm always eating. From then till now, I have actually lost 20 pounds. And my family is complaining because they say I'm losing weight too fast. I'm not hungry. But last week to please my family, I decided I would go to the doctor because I was walking in the morning and I felt a little giddy, like I toppling over. When I went, she said to me, Sylvia, you have done an excellent job. What is happening here? The A1C is 5.5. There's no longer a pre-diabetic. The cholesterol is 2.89. It is within range. The bad cholesterol is 1.46. And everything was excellent. And I said, can I come off on this medication? Can I come off of this medication? She said, no, we can't do that. But take it in half. The hypertension, you can take the tablet and you could break it in half and use half. And I'm saying that we get offended when, you know, when we ought to do certain things, even with children being obese. And you have to explain to the parents that they decline because they can't have the insurance because they are obese. They get offended and still are trying to make sure that you discipline the child. You can't have the conquerors and all these other things. Do X, do Y. As Mr. Gordy said, there's no grandparents preparing meals. Children come home from school, they watch TV, they're eating all kinds of garbage. We as uh, people have got to make some lifetime changes if we want to handle 
these um, different various illnesses. It is simple. I have done it and I, I thought I used to eat well. I thought I used to eat well, but I have got to the point where I can use sweet potatoes raw. I can use pumpkin raw as my snacks. I can use so many different things and it is working for me. So anybody who is listening on a serious note, if we really want to affect change, we can by just exercising and changing how we eat. So all the pretty fancy foods, I, and it is simple. We need to plan our meals. You know, I went from no bread to chickpeas and lentils. And I'm not complaining. I just feel a lot better and feel a lot lighter. But my question to Mr. Goddard is if I can probably lost another 10 pounds or so and get to like 179 or 180, will I ever be able to come off of this medication like the cholesterol um, tablets and the hypertension tablets? Because people are saying that you don't ever, once you start, you cannot stop. If I can really get down there and stay down there, do I still have to pay so much money? And that's why we have to pay for the insurance because once you have the insurance, every month, the cholesterol tablets, I think is some amount of money. The hypertension tablets is $60 for the 30 and I can go on. And your claims is always higher than persons who don't have any. So that is why you need to buy your insurance before the pre-existing conditions clock in, because once you have it, all your responsibility is to pay, and then we don't have a choice. But you must be fair to the insurance company. Too many people wait to when they have all of these issues, then they want to buy insurance and they want to get it at the same rate. And mind you, if you're on the rate, on the weight, you also have to pay higher for the insurance because there is supposed to be a range. You're supposed to be this age and you're supposed to be between this weight scale and that scale. And as Bajans, we like the big heavy buttons and all the kind of things and everybody telling you how nice you look and you wagging boat and everything out of whack. So you have to pay if you're underweight, if you're overweight, we need to um, pay more attention to what the children are eating, <coughs> get them to be more healthier by exercising. We sit down too often. We are not doing enough as far as exercise. For Sylvia, my question to Mr. Goddard, if I continue on this path and I continue eating the right way, can I come off of this cholesterol medication and this hypertension medication? Thank you. So, so first of all, I, I love you. You you read some really brilliant points. I really really love the fact how you've embraced change and how you have embraced what you need to do to have a healthier lifestyle. And no one can do it better than yourself. So, having embraced it, you've embarked on the journey, and that's good. Now, there's a little caveat there, and it's called the honeymoon period. And that honeymoon period says that because of the shock of the diagnosis of the shock of all these adherent diseases that you're predisposed to, it shocks you into reacting and you're reacting well. And you're doing it now, but if you can't maintain it, you can't sustain it, then trouble comes again. So the honeymoon day will be over if you can't sustain it and you slip back to your bad habits or your bad practices. So I heard you, you're gonna do all these wonderful things and I hope that you continue because if you do continue in that vein, then yes, Medication is a crux. And I saw someone answer, ask that question earlier about medication and not death and exercise. Medication is only a crutch, which means that when you're injured, you need the assistance of something to get you through. As long as you start to take over, reclaim your power, lose that weight, keep exercising, drinking water, eating to time, following all the rules, as you reclaim your power, your control, you take back what is yours. So you rest the body, the pancreas kicks back in, the blood pressure down regulates because you're no longer stressed. So yes, you can eventually overcome all of these things. And as your healthcare professional works with you, they'll reduce and reduce and reduce all your medications. Sometimes you might get under one tablet, sometimes you might get under zero tablets. But depending on how well you work together, you can come off the medication. And if you can stay on the right path and do all the right things, then you might not need the medication. 
your medication is only a crutch and it helps prevent you from getting hurting yourself more. But you have to be very, very caveat. When you feel really good, you start to get slack. You start to get <laughs> careless. And as you get careless, the bad practices creep in. And when they creep in, that's it. Now, today, people speak of diabetes reversal. And diabetes, you know, and reversal means that when you reverse it, it never happen again because you went back to the original state where it never had that defect. And whereas, and I consider that an illusion because we have not fully solved the underlying problem with diabetes, what causes diabetes. And until you know that you really can't reverse something if you don't know what you're dealing with. So yes, we know that diet and exercise is part of the, uh, the paradigm. So if we lose our weight and we start stressing the body, the stress that leads to the diabetes or the hypertension or the obesity coming on goes back, revert, then yet you go back to a lower state where your body's not as stressed out. So you don't need to have all these bad things at your door. So that's for, so for a period you have reversal of the illness. But then you get sick. You might get sick with, say, dengue or COVID. And because of the stress of that illness, boom, you go back to the other side. And here, diabetes presents itself or hypertension comes back. You could not have reversed it if it comes back so easily. So okay. whereas diet and exercise can control the scenario and make you get better, once a diabetic, always a diabetic for now. You could be the best controlled diabetic off medication. But this is a labeling. It's for you to embrace that I am good, I am normal again, as Bonnie just said, and do all the right things and stay on the right path. You will live a long and happy life. What is an adjective? If you get married and divorced, you may keep your husband's name, but that don't mean that you're bad. You still keep his name, you know? So if you're diabetic, you still have that title. You can be best well controlled diabetic without a drop of tablet in your system, if you can understand my drift. Yes, thank you very much. I plan to stay on course this time. I, I, yes, I plan on staying on course. I just don't want to add another one, a day tablet to, to my list again, you know? So some persons, as a matter of fact, somebody did say to me too, that once you're taking hypertension medication, that eventually you will become a diabetic. Is there any truth in that? Well, there's a, little, there's a lot of truth in that because I call it this, your family, call it family of cousins. You know, when you invite your cousins all come over, all have a breakfast in your house, huh? <laughs> so sometimes that happens. So if you have high blood pressure and you invite cousin diabetes over, cousin diabetes can bring cousin obesity with, with her. So when you have cousin diabetes, hypertension, obesity, then brother-in-law hyper uh, heart attack can come in, and sister-in-law stroke can come by, and then errors can start coming by. So then you have a family of fear of all the disorders because when things get too big and too rowdy, it gets out of control. So unfortunately, as the metabolic diseases stack up, more injury occurs, so more organs get involved. So when the arteries become hard, then the heart has to work harder. When the heart has to work harder, then the blood supply to the pancreas drops off. And the blood supply to the pancreas drops off, diabetes unfolds. So you don't have hypertension followed by diabetes. Because the heart is damaged, the pancreas damaged, you can't get the exercise. So your, your sedentary state increases, the metabolic rate decreases, so the obesity comes into play. So if you see how these things add on and add on and add on, so it's for you to reverse that cycle, say, let me keep young, let me keep strong, let me keep eating properly, let me keep drinking my water, let me keep exercising, let me keep moving. You're trying to push yourself back to a state when your body's not in excess and now have complications. Thank you. If we don't understand, it's because we don't want to understand. You were excellent, very clear. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we are just going to entertain two more questions. I'm looking here. I will direct both of them to Dr. Goddard. Um, someone is asking, how do you move from type one to type two diabetes and vice versa? And I will ask the second one at the same time. Is an HABA1C of five cause for any concern for persons under 40? Would any lifestyle changes be recommended? Those will be the final two questions. And we're asking Dr. Goddard to handle those as well. Thank you. So I'll start with the last first. Um, A1C of 5% or less is normal. So as long as you're, so from a diabetes point of view, that's completely normal, you're safe. The risk of diabetes developing in the next uh, five years is very, very low. However, 
you can have an A1C of five and still be overweight and still be hypertensive. So if you have other metabolic or cardiometabolic risk factors, you're still in trouble. You might not have diabetes on your radar, but you're still in trouble for some of the other ones. So maintaining diet, lifestyle, exercise, get at least 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise in three days a week, two days of resistant training, at least into the equation, eating to time, eating small meals, high fiber diet, all of those things you have to follow. You know, that's, that's the way to go. So if you can do that, you will go clear. Now, a type one diabetic, going to type two diabetes, no, that, that's, that's not on. If that happens, it means you're misdiagnosed. You're probably with a ladder or a mixture of diabetes in between and got the wrong labeling. Uh, type one, a person living with type one diabetes is the person who has an absolute lack of insulin being produced from the, from the pancreas. So you need insulin support from day one. Um, a type two is a person who may have lived a normal life and because of burden, being aging, because of overweight, because of whatever situational changes, the environment changes to the point where the body becomes overloaded and the amount of insulin being produced is no longer able to meet the demands of that person's lifestyle. And as such, now they're going to a negative decline and now need an exogenous source of insulin to keep them going. They might start in the initial phase where you have to wind up by giving them medication to squeeze extra insulin out of their own pancreas. But as they age, as time goes on, they can't maintain that squeezing effect. So then you need to put an exogenous or external insulin in to keep them normal. So the two diseases are mutually exclusive and, and, and you wouldn't probably cross paths like that. So I hope that answers the question. It's a bit more of a discussion, but I think that's the simplest I can probably give it to you in this, in this environment. Uh, you can always email me later. We can have a further discussion. Give me a call. But in this forum for now, that's probably the best way to, to, to answer your question. Yes. But, Thank you very much for that, Dr. Goddard. And that's the last question that we will entertain for the evening. So thank you very much, Dr. Goddard and the panelists for handling those questions. So now as we approach the end of our event for this evening. We would wish to share with you a short video with details of one of our latest campaigns. Hi, I'm Crystal Boye. And I'm Patrick Salt Bellamy, and we are proud brand ambassadors for Republic Bank, here to tell you about the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados' big blue dollar drive. As part of the World Diabetes Day celebrations, the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados is asking you to support their blue dollar drive all month long. Republic Bank is a proud sponsor of the blue dollar drive, as well as other activities during the month of November. Every $2 donated will help the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados to provide much needed support for children living with type 1 diabetes. I myself was diagnosed at just 10 years old. You can make your kind donations at any Ruby service station or Republic Bank Island wide. The Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados thanks you for your support of the Blue Dollar Drive. We would also like to thank our valued partners, Republic Bank, we're the one for you, Rubis, get Rubis, get going, and Lucerna, live every moment. Thank you. When you see that blue circle, don't ignore it no more. Thank you very much. And I hope you're all encouraged to participate in our drive. At this point, I will invite Mrs. Stacia Brewster, Office Administrator of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados, to render the vote of thanks. Stacia. Thank you. The trustees, Madam President, Ms. Trudy Griffith, the executive and staff of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados, family of the late John Grace, daughter Wendy McCarthy, who is joining us from Canada, and mm -hmm. granddaughter Erica Ann Grace. Ladies and gentlemen, good night. 
The mandate of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados was carried out during the last 46 years by persons who saw the vision of this great organization. We made great strides in bringing awareness about this non-communicable disease by the volunteering of services, donations, and finances, which enable us to continue our educational programs and assistance wherever necessary to our adult population and children. It gives me great pleasure to assume this role as I say thank you. First, I would like to thank our Heavenly Father for allowing us to come together once again. I would also like to thank our trustee, Canon Wayne Isaacs for invoking God's blessing on the evening's proceedings. Mrs. Valerie Marshall, Chairperson of the Eastern Region, for ably moderating this evening. Our trustee and president, Ms. Trudy Griffith, for her warm welcome and opening remarks. Our featured speaker, Dr. Carla Goddard, for his stimulating presentation on access to diabetes care. Ms. Monisha Sidney, who has shared her inspirational experience says of living with diabetes over the years. Mr. Robert Carter, pharmacist, for his pharmaceutical knowledge and highlighting the importance and relevance of medication in the treatment of diabetes. Mr. Roderick Nurse, insurance rep, for emphasizing the benefits of insurance and how persons with diabetes may access insurance. Technical producer, Mr. Ian Moore from Novum, volunteers, Mrs. Nicole Griffith Elliott, Ms. Kelly Jordan, and Ms. Shari Harris, second vice president of the Diabetes and Hypertension Association of Barbados. Our public relations officer, Ms. Kim Clark, for her tremendous efforts. The media for promoting this event, as well as being here to provide coverage. Our sponsor, the Barbados Lottery. Any company, organization, or individual who contributed towards this evening's success. Finally, you, the audience, for being attentive and participating in this educational activity. Those of you who are not members are welcome to join this worthy organization. Again, I thank you and wish you all a blessed and safe night. Thank you and good night. Thank you. That brings our evening event to an end. Good night, everyone.